The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began speaking in the synagogue, saying, Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke highly of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They also asked, Isn't this the son of Joseph? He said to them, Surely you will quote me this proverb, Physician, cure yourself. And say, Do here in your native place the things that we heard were done in Capernaum. And he said, Amen, I say to you, No prophet is accepted in his own native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was closed for three and a half years, and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only to a widow in Zarephath, in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. They rose up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town had been built, to hurl him down headlong. But Jesus passed through the midst of them. And went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We begin our novena with the prayer to St. Jude, found in your Mass accompaniment. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the Church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and suffering, particularly. that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us, for all who honor and invoke thy aid. When I was a child, I used to talk as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. How many of us, when we go to confession, find ourselves confessing the same sins over and over and over again? The same struggles in our life, day in and day out. And we know they're wrong, and we want to do the good, but the same sins just seem to hang around. On the one hand, I often tell penitents, it's a lot better than coming up with all kinds of new sins all the time. We don't need that. 
And so many of us often wonder, what does God want from me? But this is actually at least part of our answer. The things that keep coming up are the things he wants you to work on. But often we don't really know how. As children, we often understand morality as a list of things I'm supposed to do and a list of things I'm not supposed to do. And we're trained to examine our conscience based on the Ten Commandments. But when I'm stuck in sin, when I'm struggling in it, I realize I need something more than just don't do it. The problem is habitual. Literally, we have bad habits. We call them vices. And it's because of these bad habits, these vices, that we find ourselves sinning with ease. We don't even have to think about it much. We just seem to almost naturally fall into the sin. And the gossip just comes flying out of my mouth. I've once more lost my patience with the kids. And did I really just eat that half a box of cookies? And how did I get on one of these websites again? These vices are a distortion of our nature. A distortion of what we were made to be. And the solution is to root them out and replace them with good habits, with what we call virtues. Virtues are actually a perfection of our nature. And they help us to do the good with ease. So that we don't even have to think about it much. We don't have to struggle to do the good. God isn't calling us to begrudgingly do the good and with a big pout avoid the evil that we really, really, really want. When I was a child, I used to talk as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. We need to grow into the maturity and perfection of adulthood and put aside childish things. We need to change our hearts through virtue so that we can do the good with ease and even truly love to do it. That virtue, like like most habits, takes practice. And what we practice are the things we see modeled for us by those who are virtuous. As we enter into this novena for Our Lady of Lourdes preparing for her feast day on February 11th, I want us to look to Our Lady as the model of all virtues. One to whom we can go to for guidance and help as we seek to practice virtue and grow into the perfection we were made for. The perfection she exhibited throughout the whole of her life. Indeed, because she is simply a human being, she is in some ways an even better better model than her own divine son. Who would dare to think that we could have the same perfection as the infinite God incarnate? But Mary has already shown us the most perfect imitation of Jesus Christ. 
that our limited capacity allows. St. Louis de Montfort, a third order Dominican, a great proponent of the rosary and Marian devotion, proposed ten principal virtues of Mary for us to follow. Her profound humility, lively faith, blind obedience, that's going to be a fun one, continual prayer, universal mortification, another one of our favorite words, divine purity, ardent charity, heroic patience, thankfully all of us have that one already, angelic sweetness, and divine wisdom. We'll spend this novena going through these ten virtues reflecting on them in the scriptures and in the life and continuing presence of Mary, our mother. And the second reading today suggests we start with one virtue in particular, her ardent charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is, of course, a favorite passage for weddings and wall hangings. And it truly is a beautiful discourse on the love of God in our lives, which we call charity. But chapter 13 is usually not read in its context. St. Paul has just spent the last 12 years chapters of his letter trying to deal with what sounds like a terribly dysfunctional community. They're divided over which apostle they follow. They're immersed in a game of one-upmanship, trying to prove who is the most holy, who's received the greatest gifts. They're suing each other, neglecting the less fortunate among them, and willing to cause great scandal just to prove a point. Paul is not pleased at all. Chapter 13 is not a warm, fuzzy reflection on love. It's the height of St. Paul's rebuke of the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth wants to speak in tongues and prophesy and be wise and powerful in faith and ascetical practice. But they do not have love. Instead, they are impatient and unkind to one another. They are jealous and pompous. They're inflated with themselves and rude, each seeking his own interests, easily provoked to temper, and brooding over injuries. They are everything love is not. They lack what love is. They remain childish in the faith, and it's time they put aside childish. Love as a virtue, that is, charity, is not a feeling. It is the habitual friendship of God, received in baptism, that transforms everything we do. It's by this very love of God that we can love our neighbor and even our enemies precisely because we love God and he loves them. Charity. 
Charity is called the form of all the other virtues. It changes all of them that we might be prepared not just for this world, but for the eternal life to come. No virtue, no gift, not even faith can prepare us for heaven if we do not have with it charity. Without love, I am nothing. I gain nothing. The challenge then is to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 not as a nice passage we all like to hear about love, but really as an examination of conscience about whether or not we are living the Christian life. Because the measure of the person isn't power or prestige. It's not in rank or authority. It's not in what gifts we have or how much we pray or in extraordinary visions or feelings. The measure of the person is love. Mary, full of grace, shared in this very friendship with God her entire life and to the greatest degree. It is through that love that she becomes the mother of our Savior, that she makes haste to serve her cousin Elizabeth, and that she intercedes for the embarrassed couple at the wedding feast at Cain. It is that love that brings her to the foot of the cross and places her in the midst of the apostles waiting for the Pentecost. And it is with that love, that ardent charity, that she is by God's grace the mother of us all. This love in Mary is above everything she does. And so it should be in us. So go ahead and get a nice wall hanging of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But use it as that daily examination of conscience. Let St. Paul lovingly reprimand you. Helping you see where love is not in you and where you need to change. And as we continue this novena, we need to see how the ardent charity of Mary transforms the other nine virtues. And how the constant practice of this friendship of God that we too have received can transform us as well. Mary, like us, had first to receive God's love. For in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. God, who declares to each of us, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, has poured that love into our being and restored us to his friendship in baptism. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, makes that love present here on this altar, in this sacrament of charity. As we turn to this Eucharist, may the Lord not pass through our midst and go away, but may he rather stay, filling us with the same ardent charity with which he filled Our Lady, that we might grow to maturity in the practice of the virtue. And so let us offer our novena prayer to the Virgin Mary. O 
O Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, you are the refuge of sinners, the help of the sick, and the comfort of the afflicted. You know my wants, my troubles, and my suffering. By your appearance at the Grotto of Lourdes, you made it a privileged sanctuary where your favors are given to people streaming to it from the whole world. Over the years, countless sufferers have obtained the cure for their infirmities, whether of soul, mind, or body. Therefore, I come to you with St. Jude as my patron to implore your motherly intercession. Obtain, O loving mother, the grant of my requests. Through gratitude for your favors, I will endeavor to imitate your virtues that I may one day share in your glory. Amen. 